Hi everyone, I'm Sean, co-founder and chief hardware architect at Cerebra Systems. Let's imagine what's achievable if we design an architecture from ground up for neural networks. Neural networks are generally expressed as a series of gem or matrix multiply operations. And now this is valuable because it's a simple way of expressing that computation. And as a result, architectures have evolved to run these dense gem operations at higher and higher densities. This is in fact one of the primary sources of architecture improvement in the industry. It's a big part of that three times speed up that we saw in the last couple of years. But can we continue this approach and get another order of magnitude or more speed up going forward? Unfortunately, I think that's unlikely. And that's because the physical and power considerations means that you can only fit so many FMAX circuits on a single chip. And as you build larger and larger gem data pads, the larger the penalty is if the workload doesn't fit the data path exactly. And in fact, as the data path grows in size, the utilization can actually drop. So to get significant gains, we think you need to change the rules. What if you could get the same results, but with fewer flops? Is that possible? It actually is. And that's because neural networks are naturally sparse. And thinking of them as just dense gem matrix multiplies is really missing some fundamental properties of neural networks. Sparsity arises when there are zeros in the computation. And the main operation in neural networks is a multiply accumulate. And when you perform a multiply accumulate with zero, it doesn't change the result at all. Sparsible, sparsity, it can arise in neural networks for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's from common ML techniques like ReLU or Dropout. And sometimes there's sparsity even when you don't expect it. For example, there are nonlinear functions that introduce sparsity in the backward pass when the forward pass is otherwise dense. And in addition, even fully dense neural networks, they can be made sparse. In fact, inducing sparsity is often done in inference already. And this really isn't that surprising because from an intuitive sense, neural networks are by definition over-parameterized. And the act of training, in a sense, is really just trying to discover which of the parameters are important and which are not. The ML community is inventing techniques to exploit this property every day. And I've listed a few examples of sparsity algorithms in this table. And they're showing up to 10 times flop reduction and sometimes potentially even more. Now imagine if the architecture could harness this potential and enable the ML community to improve on yet more, newer, and sparser models. That would be a level of ML and hardware co-design that simply isn't possible with existing approaches. And that's because traditional gem architectures are fundamentally at odds with fine-grained, unstructured computation, which is required for sparsity. And there are really two main reasons for this. The first, is that traditional architectures use caching and local registers to exploit high degrees of data reuse. And now this works really well for dense matrix multiply, which has a lot of data reuse since it uses relatively low memory bandwidth. But the second reason is that these data paths are physically hardwired to perform structured matrix multiplication. And again, this works very well for dense matrix multiply because it enables compact and efficient designs. But both of these properties become fundamental limitations when there's sparsity. Because sparse operations have less data reuse and are unstructured. But what if you could co-design an architecture with sparsity as a first-class citizen? And you could solve these two fundamental constraints and open up the vast opportunity for ML co-design and sparsity acceleration. There's a large spectrum of ways to handle sparsity at different granularities, but let me show you how we address these two fundamental limitations at Cerebris to demonstrate it's possible to accelerate even the most fine-grained, dynamic, unstructured sparsity. 
First, let's look at memory bound. Traditional memory architectures use shared central memory. That's slow, and it's far away when you compare it to the compute performance. Even with advanced bleeding edge techniques like silicon interposers and HPM, the relative bandwidth from memory is significantly lower than the core data path bandwidth. For example, it's very common for the compute data paths to have 100 times more bandwidth than the memory. This would mean that every operand from main memory has to be used at least 100 times in the data path to keep the utilization high. Now, the traditional way to do this is by using data reuse through caching and local registers or accumulators. However, there actually is a better way to solve this problem where you can get full memory bandwidth to all the data paths. And that's by fully distributing the memory right next to where the data is being used. This enables memory bandwidths that are equal to the operand bandwidth of the core data path. This is only possible with tight co-design with the system and the machine learning. On the system side, by using wafer scale integration, we can get high capacity at orders of magnitude higher performance without orders of magnitude higher cost or power. Like the interconnect, it's just physics. Driving these bits from the memory to the data path, just tens of microns, all on silicon, is much, much easier than through a package to an external device. And for the ML co-design, the level of memory bandwidth enables some pretty remarkable capabilities. With full memory bandwidth, we can run matrix multiplication and operations at full performance across all BLAST levels. Traditional gem-based architectures with low memory bandwidth, they're restricted to running only matrix multiply at full performance. In fact, you can see that any BLAST level below full matrix multiply requires a massive jump in memory bandwidth. That's not possible with traditional memory architectures. But with enough memory bandwidth, you enable full performance all the way down to act speed, which is a vector scalar multiply. And that's important because sparse gem is just a collection of AXP operations, one AXP for every non-zero element. So with this capability, it's possible to accelerate all sparse matrix multiplies, even for completely arbitrary, unstructured sparsity. Now that we have the necessary memory bandwidth, the second fundamental challenge is how to handle the dynamic, unstructured nature of sparsity. Now for that, it's, it's possible to use fine-grained data flow scheduling. And here, all compute is triggered by the data. In the compute core, we have a fabric that transports data and associated control all in the hardware. And once the core receives the data, it triggers the tensor instruction to run. And with this hardware data flow mechanism in all of the cores, the entire compute fabric is really a data flow engine. And this data flow engine enables native sparsity harvesting because you can simply filter out all the zeros at the sender. Since the compute is all triggered by the data, if the sender doesn't send any data, the receiver doesn't perform any compute. It's really that simple. Not only do you save the power because you're not performing the wasted operations, but you also get acceleration by skipping the wasteful work and using those cycles to perform the next useful work. This is only possible with tight co-design with the machine learning and the compiler and kernel software. On the machine learning side, this natively accelerates natural sparsity, but also enables co-design of new sparse ML models. And on the software side, we co-design the software to be data flow aware from the ground up. To illustrate what that looks like, let's look at a sparse matrix multiply kernel as an example. Here, we consider the entire wafer as a single giant sparse matrix multiply array. And let me show you how that works. 
we start with activations distributed across the wafers on chip memory. Then we stream the weights through. As they stream through, they trigger the multiplication with the local activations, one individual weight at a time. This is where we're using that fine-grained data flow mechanism built into the cores, performing that one XB vector scalar multiply on every weight that comes through. And we're skipping all of the zero weights. And the full memory bandwidth is what's enabling all of this at full performance. The resulting partial sums are then accumulated across the entire wafer at high bandwidth. And there's no need to block or to partition the matrix. Because of the sheer size of the wafer, we can operate on the full range of matrix sizes. And lastly, this is the exact same flow that supports both dense and sparse computation. And here are some of the results that we've measured. In our lab, we've measured speed up of fully unstructured weight sparsity on GPT-3 size layers, all the way up to 90% sparsity. That's 10 times more zeros than non-zeros. And on the right, you can see the lab results showing near linear speed up even at this extreme level of sparsity. The only limitation is really just Amdahl's law because you have to amortize the fixed overheads. But our massive memory and interconnect bandwidth enable us to reduce that overhead significantly, as you can see in the results. And that overhead actually reduces further as the model size grows. So these results demonstrate that we can accelerate fully unstructured sparsity, which is not possible in traditional gem matrix multiply architectures. And therefore, we can accelerate all types of ML sparsity algorithms that are already available today but also enable a whole new class of smarter, sparser models that are actively being developed. As a community, it's through this level of ML co-design that we believe it's practical to reach extreme scale models. By doing this, we can break free from traditional brute force flop scaling. In fact, we believe that sparsity opportunities only increase as the model size grows. So coming back to the grand ML demand challenge in front of us, with techniques like sparsity that can enable deep ML co-design, along with other traditional architecture improvements, there is a path to driving an order of magnitude or more architecture performance. This is done by changing the rules. This enables us to go beyond just flops and enable an entirely new class of sparse ML techniques co-designed with the ML community. That is not possible otherwise.